Hey there. This is Alonzo Davis, and I want to welcome you to this broadcast. This is another faithful message here from us at Cold Ministries, and I pray that you would stay tuned to allow your spirit to be edified, exhorted, and comforted from the word of the Lord that you're about to hear. God bless you. Hey, I'm glad you clicked on this video. Uh, today, we are starting a series of series, if we want to call it that. And uh, so I just... So, you know, you got to listen to God when you do certain things like this and the Lord will tell you what to speak about. And I'm not going to say for the longest because then that makes me seem rebellious. But for the longest, I had an impression on me, an unction to talk about Hebrews chapter six, verses one and two. So I have this put up right before me on my iPad. And uh, let me read this to you all. It says, therefore, Leaving the principles of doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And he says, we'll do these things if God permits. And so we see here, right? He says he wants to move on from these things he calls them actual principles as in like elementary of doctrine of jesus christ he says let us go on unto perfection he doesn't want to lay again the foundation of repentance from dead works faith towards god doctrine of baptisms laying on of hands and resurrection from the dead oh there's a sixth one and eternal judgment so here we have six principal doctrines about our belief of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to go ahead and just say we've really been talking about faith or faith towards God is what the doctrine is called. Uh, pretty much for the entirety of me doing this stuff. Nevertheless, I'm not going to like he's saying here, I'm not going to lay that foundation again. But what I've been impressed to do is to go ahead and put the foundation down for people that are following me and listen to me speak of the rest the other five of these things and i want to start in order and then go down from that one because i already skipped to the second one which is faith toward god and we're going to discuss uh yeah here it says repentance from dead works now this is what our series is going to be on and so let me set it up i don't really want to do too much fluff talking kind of want to get into it but you can't do that unless you explain things so repentance from dead works. First of all, what is repentance? Well, I, what comes to mind for me, actually, is you see two of them, two of them being two ways of repentance throughout the Bible. For sure, there might be more, but I'm familiar with two as I'm talking right now. And one of them is to have a contrite spirit. The Bible says that God repented for wanting to do wrath unto Israel. And it says that God was sorrowful to even have thought to bring about the judgment that he wanted to bring to them when they did the, uh, the golden calf idol thing. And then there's repentance of what we talk about mainly in the prior, prior what's the word, that we talk about, it's like priority. I want this to sound more educated than mainly. But I can only think of mainly. So the, the repentance we mainly speak about in the um, New Testament, excuse me, is the repentance of the, the heart or the mind or the soul, right? Which is to change the mind. And when someone changes their mind, understand you'd also, by consequence, change your actions because every action first begins with a thought. So when you start changing the way you think, you would then understand that people will start changing the way that they act. When somebody now thinks that it's not okay to keep eating junk food all day because they see the results of it, they start acting differently. They start going to the gym. They start dieting, right? And so when we're talking about repentance from dead works here in the uh, New Testament, also I can even make sure of it right here. Let me look at uh, the Greek word for it right now. Hebrews 6, 1. Let's see what it says. <clears throat> Yes, this is repentance, metanoia, metanoia, which is to change the mind. And so there is a principal elementary doctrine of Jesus Christ that is literally just changing your mind about dead works. Not just about them, but changing it from dead works. 
So do we, do we get that? Are we understanding this? And so if we don't have the foundation of this, I, it honestly messes everything up. Let's, uh, it, yeah, let's just turn to James chapter one really quickly. Let me, let me put this up as well. Book of James chapter one. I'm reading out the King James version because I'm, the way I studied it is in the King James. So look at verse 19 of uh, James chapter one. Oh, by the way, the, um, what I want to say. So, you know, there's James and John, the uh, sons of Zebedee. Turns out James' name was actually Jacob, but they changed it to James in honor of King James, which is interesting, right? And so because King James translated the Bible into English, I believe that's what the story goes as. He switched some stuff around. And one of them is the name of Jacob into his own name, James. Nevertheless, it has nothing to do with uh, making the Bible a heretical book or something that's like erroneous in its entirety. Many translations of the New Testament are so accurate one-to-one -one, that there are those that exist that are 99.9% .9 copies. So here I go talking fluff when I did it one to because this is a timed video. So we're talking about the foundational principle of repentance from dead works. And this is important because if we don't get this down first, right, this one's the foundation. If we don't get this down first, there's nothing else to build. You can't even go into the next elementary doctrines because this is why. James chapter 1 verse 19 says, Wherefore, my beloved brother, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. For the wrath of man works not the righteousness of God. That's self-explanatory. It says, Wherefore, let's lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word. That's so good. Why do we have to receive it from, with meekness? Because who are we receiving the word from? You know, I'll just go ahead and say this. There's a difference between humility and meekness. The thing is, you look at the definitions, they are synonyms. But the Bible only tells us to be humble unto God. Our humility as human beings goes to God. However, God then gives us the power to be meek to other people. And so... If you humble yourself under God, then you would then be able or empowered or given the grace by the Holy Spirit. This is the fruit of the Spirit, right? To be meek to fellow man in order to honor the treasure that God has placed in these earthen vessels. And so we are going to receive the word, the engrafted word on today. Well, it's been engrafted in the hearts of mankind. Who are the preachers now? It's our fellow brothers as our, our ministers now, our fellow brothers and sisters, right? And so we need to be meek. We need to, we need to humble ourselves in our own sight in order to, well, let me put it in this example. You're not going to receive from somebody that you see yourself eye to eye with. I can't receive from a man of God if I feel like I'm better than him or if I see myself just as whatever as him, right? I need to classify myself as meek in order for me to receive from this person's ministry, okay? And so that's what James is talking about there. It says, which is able to save your souls? Be ye or it says verse 22, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. So people that just hear and don't do are deceiving themselves. Because the thing is, somebody who hears might believe it, but if they don't do, you can't call yourself a disciple because disciples model their lives. That's an action. They model their lives after their teacher. And so James says, don't be like this because you're going to deceive yourself. Deceive yourself into what? Thinking that, that, that your soul is saved. People that only hear the word but don't do it deceive themselves into thinking that they're saved. If I'm just putting two verses together. So verse 23 says, For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man who beholds himself, his natural face in a glass. For he does look at himself, but he goes away and immediately, immediately forgets what manner of man he was. So he forgets what he even saw in the mirror. He says, but whoso looks into this perfect law of liberty, speaking of the word of God, it says, and continues in it. He being not forgetful, uh, being not a forgetful for hearer, but a doer of the word, this man shall be blessed in his deed. 
in his doing. The blessing comes in his doing. The blessing comes and overtakes you as you do what you have heard. So the blessing of salvation comes as you do what you've heard, which is what? Believe in your heart, then confess with your mouth. A lot of people believe in God. They respect God in their own minds. They honor God. You can't say Jesus' name in vain in front of them. They're going to get upset about it. But the thing is, they are still not modeling their life after Jesus Christ, nor acting in the same light as Jesus Christ. And that is an issue. That is a problem. Don't be like that. And so here we have it. What we just found out even deeper is he's talking about somebody receiving the word of God. He says if someone only receives it in ear, but they don't actually receive it in action, it's like someone who looks in a mirror and forgets what they even saw. So what does that mean? He's likening the word of God unto a mirror. But the thing is, a hearer and not a doer what they're only a hearer and not a doer. This is the reason why. This is a reason why I'll say it this way. It's because they're not relating themselves with what they are hearing. Now, <clears throat> people look at TED Talks, you watch informational videos, you want to do something that you've seen somebody else do when they were successful at it. And so what do you do? You go and research. Let me hear about, let me learn what this person was doing in order to get the results that they have because I want to copy that. I want to model myself after that to get those results myself. So what you're doing is you're relating yourself to this other person's actions. What can I do that this person has done in order to get where they are? Now, the thing is, there's a there's a confusion. People do that with the word of God. Or well, people don't do that with the word of God, but they'll do it with something else is what I really mean to say. And so they'll listen to the word of God. But because they don't relate themselves to it, they don't believe that they'll get the results that the Bible says they don't do. Surely God doesn't mean I need to give this money. Doesn't he see I got this bill to pay for that bill to pay for yada yada. Right. And so, <clears throat> not to get off on a separate topic, but the thing is, because people read the word of God, but they do not relate themselves, they don't see themselves within it, they forget what they have even heard, which means they don't even do what they have heard. So, in the topic of being sinless, this is the foundation, the Bible says. This is a principle doctrine, and this is the foundation. Repentance from dead works. Well, what is dead works? The Bible says, sin leads to death. So I'll just sum it up as this. Dead works are is sin. The Bible also says anything done without faith is sin. So putting all this together, we know what repentance is, change of mind. We know what a dead work is, sin. So what is Paul telling us? There is a foundational principle of doctrine that is changing your mind about sin. For example, this gave me pleasure, but I want pleasure forevermore. That pleasure was fleeting. The Bible says Moses decided instead of enjoying sin and its pleasures for a season to suffer with his brothers and sisters of Israel. But we do. We also know, right, if sin has pleasure for a season, it can't compare to the pleasure of God. Why? Because it says in the presence of God is a fullness of joy and in his right hand. This is my right hand, but it'll be mirrored. Our pleasures forevermore. And so the pleasure of sin doesn't even amount to the, the pleasure in God's right hand. So let's change our mind about sin. I mean, simple enough, right? Well, it should be. But here we have it is we have not established this foundational principle because people are not being taught to see themselves in the word here. And so they are not being a doer when it comes to doctrine, what is written about sin. We know what sin is. We know that we all used to be sinners or we will say it this way. We know that we all are sinners. Right. That's what people say. They don't put it in the past tense because they're not relating themselves to what the covenant is now. And that is the problem. So because people cannot stop seeing themselves as a sinner, which means that that which honestly corresponds with how they continue on in sin and not actually living in freedom from sin because people cannot see themselves as the foundation. Someone who has repented from dead works. I've changed my mind about dead works. I'm not doing them anymore. I've received grace and power to move on and do things that are fruitful because now I have been justified and the just live by faith and faith always produces fruit. Okay, because that is not established, people don't produce fruit. 
They haven't moved on from literally the foundation. I'm no longer a sinner, nor do I have to answer to sin. And if we would just believe what doctrine says, we'll see that. And then you'd understand this thing right here. What? Let's go to John chapter 8. Verse 1. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple. And all the people came unto him. And he sat down and he taught these people that came to him in the temple, right? It says, And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. I'm not going to preach on that, but isn't that crazy? Now Moses in the law commanded us, that such should be stoned, but what do you say? This they said, tempting Jesus, that they might have some reason to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and put his finger, stooped down with his finger and wrote on the ground as though he didn't even hear them. So when they continued to ask him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. So, okay, so whoever sinless, throw the first stone. I've already preached the uh, actual interpretation from the original language. I haven't studied it, but it just it's, I'm saying it because it, it bears need to say, right? I've heard it preached before that he said, those of you who haven't committed the same sin, throw the first stone. Verse 8, and again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And when they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one beginning at the eldest until the, the least eldest, right? And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. Verse 10, when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, woman, where are those that accuse you? Has no man condemned you? Jesus then says, I wrote verse 11, she said, no man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, neither do I condemn you. Colon, go and sin no more. Now here, why does Jesus tell her to do something that she's not able to do? Or rather, did Jesus tell her to go and do something that he has now empowered her to fulfill? Why can I say that? Because Jesus empowered the disciples to do things that they shouldn't have been able to do. Not until they have the Holy Spirit, at least. But here's the thing about the ministry of Jesus Christ. It was a revelation of the new law. As Jesus was now coming and being the fulfillment of our new priest, by oath, God prophesied that Jesus was going to be our new priest, pretty much. I'm just putting everything together there, what it says. And so what does that mean? Verse, Hebrews uh, chapter 7 tells us that if there is a new priesthood, then that bears to say there also must be a new law. So Jesus didn't operate the way Jesus did the things he did because he was not operating under the Levitical law. He was operating under the new covenant law. That's why the disciples were able to do this before he actually went and died. That's why people, that's why he tells his women this right here before he went and died. Why? Because Jesus, by the mercy of God, empowered these people to live by his new covenant while he was there on earth filled with the Holy Spirit. And so when he tells this woman, go and sin no more. Well, understand this. God's word does not come back void. And what it sets out to do, it accomplishes. And so when he told the woman, go and sin no more, he also, the word of God is speaking here. The same word that by, the, by this word and faith, the world was framed also empowered her to do it. I'm getting hot. Let me wipe my uh, face. I just have this. Whew. But what can we say to these things? You know what Peter found out? When Jesus was walking on water and the disciples saw him and thought he was a ghost, Peter cries out, you know, as rambunctious as Peter was, it was this was pretty wise though. Nobody else can say they did this. Nobody I know can say that they've done this. He goes, Lord, if it be you, not let me come unto you by the water. He says, command me to come. And Jesus says, come. Peter steps out of the boat and by faith he walks on water. Why? Because he put his faith in the word of God, which was to come to Jesus. And as long as he stayed focused on fulfilling the command of God, he was empowered to do that what he was commanded. So look, in the same manner, if a man can do the impossible, which was walk on water, and nobody doubts that, 
Why are we doubting to sin no more? It makes no sense, especially when we get on further and read what did the early church fathers, I don't say early church fathers, what did the apostles in the Bible, what was their stance on sin, on dead works? Because honestly, what we're going to read and find out is that all of them taught, believed, and fulfilled what it is to be not only free, or I'll say it this way, not only forgiven from sin, but actually set free from sin. The Bible says, he who the son set free is free indeed. You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. The Bible says that sin is a snare. So a snare is something that captures you. But when you get to Jesus Christ, he sets you free, free. That's what free indeed means. It means free, free. Like somebody's super tall, they're tall, tall. Somebody set free by Jesus Christ, they are free, free. So it makes no sense when Jesus came and shed his blood and died a sinner's death, died as sin. It makes no sense that his sacrifice for our sakes was not enough to set us free, free. There's an error in our understanding there because that's not what the Bible tells us. It tells us that we were set free and free indeed. This is why Moses was con not condemned. This is why Moses was punished for striking the rock twice in the wilderness, because that rock was symbolic of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is not going to be crucified twice. We'll read it later, but Paul says the brother that continued sinning is basically crucifying Jesus again, and Jesus will not die a second time. The Bible says that it's appointed once for a man to die. Jesus already died as a man. He's been glorified now and seated back where he came from, on the throne, or to the right hand of the Father, next to the throne. And so... What we're going to get into, I'll do it next episode. This will be a short one. Yeah, it's going to have to be a short one. But what I want to get into, maybe I can do a little bit more. I'll still finish this thought, though. What we are getting into is what does the Bible teach about sin? No, I don't even want to do that. What does the Bible talk about? I don't even want to do that either. What is the series going to be? Doctrine of sinlessness. That's not a really good ring to it, but that's what it will talk about. We're going to read what the Bible says about being free from sin. We're going to not necessarily, not necessarily formulate, but I'll teach theology on being free from sin, which is accurate to what is written doctrinally from the Bible. And so um, if there's anything I've been anointed to do, dismantle heresy and even just maybe it's not necessarily heresy or the heart behind what's being taught isn't heretical maybe actually it probably is all the time but to also to 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 point out to expose man's wisdom disguised as god's wisdom and so too many people are not going further and living frustrated lives in the spirit and supernaturally, though they are believers, because they cannot relate to the foundational elementary doctrine of Jesus Christ, which is repentance from sin. And we're going to get to the bottom of it and we're going to build up and edify ourselves on what the truth of the gospel is. So thank you for watching this. And I'll continue with the next episode. God bless you and keep you. So we've come to the end of this broadcast, and I want to thank you for watching. But if you're looking for more content, please visit us at koleministries.org and click the I'm Ready button to let us know if you just got saved or you want to share a personal testimony. And if you want to partner with our ministry, find out how by clicking the Give button on the same homepage. God bless you and keep you.